Hi, Ron, and welcome to ABC's of Anesthesia. And today we have a really special guest, Associate Dean Forbes McGain. Now, Forbes, really great to have you on board here. Um, Forbes is an anesthetist and intensive care physician at Western Health in Melbourne, Australia. Uh, and he's also the Associate Dean in a Sustainable Healthcare within the Faculty of Medicine, Dentistry and Health Sciences at the University of Melbourne, and also has a PhD in Sustainable Healthcare. Now, from my point of view, he's an absolute leader. He inspires change to make healthcare more sustainable. Um, and, you know, he generally cycles, runs and walks everywhere. So he really, you know, talks the talk and walks the walk as well. And he has inspired me and many, many others in our department to adopt sustainable care practices and to make that our priority. So welcome, Forbes. Thank you very much for that very kind invitation to hear it. Wow. Um, it's, it's joyous to be here as uh, part of your, your group. I, I, know you're, <laughs> I know you're really busy and, you know, being the uh, acting director of I see, I see at the moment with the EMR change, there's a lot of work. So yeah, really appreciate you being here. Um, look, I, I thought we'd just get started. Like, um, I think you're probably one of the most prominent people in the sustainable healthcare space in Australia, definitely, and maybe even worldwide. And I know you get invited a lot to these international conferences to speak. Um, what, tell me about the start of it all. How, what inspired you to do things like this in life and, uh, and, and focus on yeah. this? Yeah, it's a really interesting, isn't it, about how your background might shape how you end up behaving, you know, the behaviour of, of your parents and what they teach you. I actually was, um, uh, I grew up m most of my sort of formative years as a kid and adolescent was actually in northern New South Wales and I lived on an avocado, uh, custard apple and macadamia farm, believe it or not. And uh, it was a, a wonderful, almost idyllic life in many ways. Um, yes, I did go to school. Um, and, but, you know, like at the, at the, the bottom of the, um, of the farm, there, there was a creek and we would fish in it, we'd fish for eels, um, a platypus we'd see every now and again uh, on dusk. Uh, and it was just, you know, really, I think an experience of being immersed in nature in many ways that, that I think led me to think more deeply about how we, uh, how, you know, how we interact with nature and, and our burden that we create on the world as well as how we can try and make it better. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think from, did, did you did you notice a change? Like, I don't know if you go back to that spot, but do, have you noticed that there's, I don't know, something sad about maybe less fish or the platter was mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. um, can exist there? It's a really good question. You call, you're, you're describing solastalgia, which means a, 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 a sort of a, lo a feeling of loss about something that was in the past. Mm. And that could be still present, present as in physically present. Um, so, yeah, fortunately, that part of the world, that particular area, was far enough away from urbanisation and towns to to not be an issue. It's actually uh, um, fairly close to Alstonville, um, between Lismore and Ballina, and that sort of area of lovely verdant rolling hills mm. in northern New South Wales. So that still remains country farms and things like that. So that's that's great. Yeah, and when did you first start thinking, you know, you obviously did medical school, graduated, went through your training. When did it, when did you start kind of affecting this type of change? Was as a registrar, consultant? Yeah, I, it's, it's, it's interesting how it evolved. And I think that I was probably quite delayed compared to some of the youngies today who are active as uh, medical students even, as Doctors mm. for the Environment, for example, have a medical student group, um, as well as residents and registrars, you know, we, we interact with every day. We're very proactive here. Mm. I didn't have that because I didn't really have senior people above me who, mm. walked the, you know, walk the walk or talk the talk. There just wasn't really anything going on. And so for me, it really started uh, when I was went to Alice Springs for a year as a consultant um, with a well, I was with the Royal Flying Doctor Service as well as um, the intensive care unit with Penny Stewart and with um, uh, the anaesthetic department at Ella Springs as well, which was which was a real eye opener, I suppose. To yeah, you can start to make real change, particularly as you become more senior as a medico. Yeah. Okay. Now, and then Western Health. Yeah, and it's just blossomed from there. I, I mean, it's a, it's a whole thing about priorities. I, you know, I remember. No, no one would argue against recycling, reusing, and reducing, and kind of important principles like that. I just remember it, it, it didn't seem like the biggest priority when I was training. And I remember first coming to Western Health, and I think uh, Bob's, you walked into theatre and you said, "Hey, so why are you using desflurane?" And and for me, it it was you know this 
feeling of having a slightly faster turnover, maybe by 30 seconds to a minute or whatever number I picked there, that felt like the most important priority at the expense of everything. And I wasn't against recycling, reducing or reuse, but it just felt like it wasn't at the forefront of my mind. I think you definitely implanted that you know, urgency in me uh, or that, that, that feel that, that need to reorder my priorities. And I think, you know, just speaking to people, I, I suspect that you've done that to many people in our department and potentially even further along. Is that the, is that the kind of feeling that you get? Um, I think, yeah, I think that there's a momentum for change. I think that what we're seeing, and uh, I think anesthesia is leading the way here within medicine, um, but it's great that it's now, in, you know, gradually spreading out to certainly intensive care I know about, but also in uh, physicians uh, and their training programs and also surgeons now. Uh, I think that that's really exciting that that change is starting. But you're right that um, this is a gradual process. It's almost like you need those individual nuanced chats with everyone. And the, and the great thing is it's an exponential process in a way, Lahiri, yeah. because you now uh, are doing the same thing. And I didn't tell you to go and do it. You're just doing it off your own bat and you're just you're genuinely interested in this topic. Um, and you're, uh, it's not all just about further research. It's about engagement and education mm. uh, and involvement of that process as you describe it of um, okay, so we, we always have to be completely, uh, completely and utterly focused on the patient in front of us. But we also have scholar roles. We also have advocacy roles uh, as medicos to, to make a real change beyond the patient that's in front of us, which includes resource use, you know, financial, environmental, whatever it ha- happens to be, um, that, that influence our decision-making processes. Yeah. Absolutely. So I thought we, we might try to do a deep dive. I, you know, I know that I've got a large mm. doctor audience and registrar audience, and it'd be great mm. to kind of cover a few things about maybe what is the environmental cost of healthcare, maybe what that compares to, and mm. maybe get to very practical elements about, you know, what do you do at home to help and what do you do at work to help? Maybe some big mm. changes that you've slowly worked on over time, and also what junior doctors can do to create change or what small steps uh, they can yeah. take in the space. So m- maybe to start yeah. with you, what what do you know? I know you've done your PhD in this. So what is the environmental cost of healthcare? Maybe anesthesia, and how does that compare mm. to other other things? Mm. Yeah. So maybe if we just take uh, a very rough approximation, uh, I was involved with some work um, from Aaron Ema Malik and the rest from Sydney Uni, as well as Scott McAllister, who's done life cycle work with me for over fifteen years. The carbon footprint of Australian healthcare as a proportion of the total economy, is around 7%. So in other words, it's about the same as everything that everyone does in Brisbane of 2 million people, city of 2 million people, all their flights or their cars or their clothing or their food, everything they do is about the same, uh, those Brisbaneites be about the same as what is going on with um, healthcare in Australia. Another way to think of it is it's about half of agriculture. Agriculture is about 15% of the carbon footprint of the economy and, and healthcare is seven. So it's still quite significant. It's not, it's not the most important, but it is important. Now, within that, um, we know that, and these will be approximations, we know that energy and lighting and those things that are going on at the moment are important in hospitals and, and hospitals are big users of that. But also we know there's a lot of stuff being used you know, uh, all of this, uh, you know, all of these single-use equipment we might be using as opposed to reusable equipment. Um, and so that that sort of brings into the story of how clinicians of all sorts um, can can make a real difference, doctors, nurses, physio, and everyone else. Now, if, if we start to focus then down on particular craft groups, and we'll talk about anesthesia, I mean, as you know, it's, it's not really necessary to dwell on it too much, but I think it's so important to be aware of it, is that there are a few things you can do at the micro level, then there's the meso level, and then the macro level. Um, I can explain those a bit further if you want as we go along. Or yeah, absolutely. Okay. I, actually, before you go on to that, so say so seven seven percent uh, is the is the carbon roughly. Yeah. What, yeah. what what would be reasonable to get down to? Like I, I imagine there's a lot of low mm. that we could pick mm. away. What yeah. would be an ideal number? Yeah. So so good question. I mean, so what we sort of know in the UK is more like four percent. Okay, so the UK, yes, they probably spend less money, uh, and money is really important because all money generates carbon in a sense. It's just a matter of how it does, but it can be more efficient. You can start to uncouple the carbon footprint with the funny with the um, with the money footprint. Uh, so the uh, that's just an example of where you can be more efficient with with certain how you spend your dollars, and also how you start to decarbonize 
you know, the services, the electricity grid, et cetera, that is very different in, say, Europe and the UK compared to Australia. Australia is changing quickly, uh, but with a long way to go um, mm. because of our reliance, particularly on coal. Um, so other, other uh, that, that's more the broad sense of how you could start to reduce it. Um, another way of looking at it, though, is the opposite direction in a way here. In the US, the US healthcare system is so large that it is has the same carbon footprint of all of the United Kingdom. So everything that everyone does for those 60 million people in the UK, that is the same as the US healthcare system. It's massive. Mm-hmm. Um, but we're a little bit of an outlier. There, there are studies that have been done in these sort of areas now that are becoming inc- along with increasing frequency. Uh, but certainly you, you could easily halve our um, carbon footprint without seriously affecting at all the um, uh, effectiveness of care. Now, I will mention also low value care is really important here. It's not just about just, you know, reducing and reusing, for example, things. It's much more about avoiding low value care, unnecessary care, even, even you know, potentially harmful care. Mm. Uh, and we know roughly from work that have come out of um, Wiser Healthcare and others in, in Sydney Uni and beyond that, um, that probably, you know, at, at least a quarter of all care is low value care. Mm. So... Yeah, not not just the carbon footprint. So this is really about is that action worthwhile doing? Because if you're doing an unnecessary mm. investigation, that's a whole mm. carbon footprint kind of life cycle of that of that and, investigation and all that unnecessary yeah. intervention. We mm. could talk about many things. I mean, more. It's interesting, Mihiru, In the ICU, for example, my work is not so much about you know reusable equipment, which is within anaesthesia and gas choice and that sort of stuff. It's much more about okay, how can we these liver function tests. Do we? Why are we doing these liver function tests when no one is uh, no one is changing their behaviour as a result of these liver function tests, for example, or clotting profiles? Hmm. So there's all those sorts of really avoidance. So I would stress very carefully: it's, it's it's all about avoidance first, then reduce, then reuse, and then finally recycle if you can't uh, do the others. I've got to say, so you know, three R's sounds good, but A R R R doesn't sound as yeah. great. Uh, the, the 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 R mentality. <laughs> yeah. Um, so let's go on then. So the things, uh, I'm not sure which way to structure this, but what are the things, mm. that, you know, you, you would have brought into Western health and what are the things in general that yeah. uh, doctors, yeah. Yeah, can yeah. Do? yeah. So, so probably, um, in the micro level, cause this is something we can all do, mm-hmm. um, for this audience, which is going to be mainly anesthesia, mm-hmm. um, is, is important. So yes. Certainly, avoiding the use of death um is is pretty pretty obvious. Uh, a nice little number to remember is uh, one hour of anaesthesia at one mac um, at um, half to one litre, depending on your flow rates of uh, fresh gas flow. So, in other words, relatively low flows uh, will be the same as driving a Hummer uh, two hundred kilometres. Now, a Hummer has the fuel efficiency of uh, sixteen litres to the hundred. So it absolutely just guzzles. Yeah. Uh, so it's like burning about 30 litres of petrol for that hour. So oh, wow. 30 litres of petrol CO2 emissions is similar to Desrain running at one Mac at less than one litre per minute flows. Mm-hmm. So it's it's large. Now, nitrous is also problematic. It's not quite, but it's fairly close to Desrain. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's it, it just that we don't tend to use it as a full Mac, obviously. It oh. you know, might be half a Mac or two-thirds of a Mac. And so, but overall, it is it is problematic as well. So nitrous oxide, I, I probably won't have time to talk too much about the nitrous oxide. Um, what we're working on, as you know, is, you know, it's quite exciting working on the nitrous oxide leaks, which I know a lot of others are doing around the world, particularly coming out of the UK with Alifia Chakera um, and uh, some good work that's helping with the Melbourne University group. Uh, they've um, by uh, myself and Eugenie Kayak and Ben Dunn and some others. So some good work happening there. Mm. Um, so nitrous is really important as well, avoiding that. Um, I think it's really interesting just sticking on the gases, though. Mm. Um, you can say, well, what about any other gas? Surely there's not really much else. Well, there's oxygen and there's air. And it's mm. funny to think of it that way. I mean, as you as you know, we did a, we did a study of um, looking at, uh, a to- the, the anesthesia for a total knee replacement. So we looked at a number of different patients and compared spinals versus generals versus the combination for, for patients. And we were really, I mean, what I really enjoy about life cycle assessment, I'm sorry I haven't really defined what that is to the team, but uh, it's basically carbon or environmental footprinting, water footprint, petrochemical, whatever you want to do. Um, and what we found from our study at Western Health is that 
for the spinal patients, because you were running six litres, and some people were running 10 litres of oxygen a minute, um, the actual footprint that came through from, and the and the energy costs, because don't forget you need to turn this oxygen into liquefied oxygen back in a great big storage tank, um, actually starts to add up and becomes in the same sort of order of magnitude as if you're running low-flow desert, low-flow sevofluorane, for example. Mm. So it's actually quite interesting to think that there's another opportunity for change when you've got a spinal patient who actually, you know, maybe they can have nasal prongs. I mean, it's not designed to mm. change your behaviour to, in you know, uh, uh, lead to a patient being in danger, mm. but at the same time, it's about being sensible and rational and reasonable in your use of, of anything, uh, gas or otherwise. So oxygen can be quite important. Yeah. Um, so just so, to clarify, so, spinal yeah. versus general, if you're using kind of six to 10 liters on a Hudson mask, ends up being roughly similar to running C. Yeah, that's what I, so that's what we, we looked at, um, uh, what we did was, for the, for the listeners, um, we had three groups of 10 patients each, and we just measured, it was an observational study, just measuring what was being used for those cases. Most of the cases, certainly at that time, were mainly sevofluorane. Um, for the general anesthetics, if there was a few teeters. Uh, the general anesthetic plus spinal was obviously the combination of the two. And then the third group was just purely the spinal group. For the purely spinal group, uh, evidently they got the Hudson mask and oxygen. And what I would say is it's not, it wasn't so much a comparison. It was more just here is some data. But you can see that what you can clearly see is the orders of magnitude are fairly similar. It's in, in Australia. Now, I just... You know, that caveat about in Australia is more just about ING source being mainly coal in Victoria, very different in Tasmania, for example. But when you've got an, an energy source that's, you know, compressing the oxygen that's based on coal, then the actual carbon footprint can actually become quite significant mm-hmm. um, in the same order of magnitude as delivering, you know, low-flow sevofluorine. Mm-hmm. Um other things that add to that story, of course, are where you're using a reusable or disposable gown and um, how much equipment you're using, how much plastic, how many syringes you're using, all those sorts of things add together. They're all small yes. and, you know, the drugs, et cetera, they're all small, but they all add up. I mean, as an order of magnitude, your three-hour, just the anaesthetic components, so not the surgery, not the engineering, the heating ventilation, we're excluding that. Um, the anaesthetic component for that three-hour knee replacement is equivalent to about um, – seven or eight litres of petrol being burnt. So it's it, it, it's it's very different to the 30, 30 litres of petrol per hour for the low-flow des rain. Um, so already it's like a law of diminishing returns. I'm sorry, guys, you you get to – if you dump your des in your, in your nitrous, you're already way down here. But yeah. then there's all those other things that still add up. Now, the reason why I don't want everyone, anyone to get despondent about that and feel, wow, it doesn't matter, I've stopped using nitrous and desiccant, don't have to do anything now. No, because you think of the sheer volume of procedures being done every day. So if everyone moved where they could to be using nasal prong oxygen on the spinal, for those patients who are suitable, of course, mm. then that actually would be quite important and you become part of a story of much greater change. It's not that, Then you move from the micro into the macro, in a sense, yes. uh, as, we, as we talk about. So that's what I'm very excited about. Uh, and also what is a sense of whether it be frustration or difficulty is how do I influence people outside of Western health to make change? I know it's happening. I know it's happening in pockets here, there and everywhere. Yeah. It's great. But um, it's it's also the realisation that we need people like you uh, and, and others who are in those other places uh, doing good things. And and it's no secret. I think we had a chat, chat about this, Forbes, that you know, if there's one thing I could do with ABC's anesthesia, you would have a sustainability arm to where we have really important stuff. My, my major audience on YouTube is, you know, in, in India and the US. And mm. I imagine mm. India would be, mm. there'll be a lot of low level fruit there for how you could possibly, mm. um, you know, do more efficient practice in, in certain aspects. And, you know, that comes from not, not really knowing. So I'm just assuming there. But, but also we could learn from India. You know, I mean, that, yeah. that would be really interesting to have some sort of, you know, down the track, some sort of workshop where we could all uh, that, learn from each other about that. That would be that, fascinating. That is yeah. definitely going to happen in the future. I yeah. can see it. <laughs> <laughs> I'd love so, that. Yeah. So, yep, desflurane, nitrous, spinal versus general ox- oxygen. What other things? Can yeah. yeah. So once again, then we, then we move into um, back in 2009, I think this is my first little study where we, you know, mm. um, these are just the reusable drug trays. You can see boring things, but they're, 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 they're what we use. I, and the default at the time, Gone, yeah. I literally, as I first did my fellowship, 
at the Western Hospital. I moved in from another hospital and I thought, what, what is this? What, how, how are we allowed to use that? that this, this seemed unconscionable. It's a non-sterile <laughs> tray. It doesn't matter that in the sterile tray, it becomes very quickly non-sterile because, you know, we're yeah. placing, you know, yeah. and placing things in. But it just blew my mind because mm. I'd never seen yeah. it. Yeah. And, 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 and people were not dying from infected, <laughs> you know, drug <laughs> trays. Um, so it, it's a good point. And, through all, and I want to make it very clear, for all of my studies, I've always involved infection prevention at the beginning and saying, what do you think about this? You know, what, what if we do this? You know, recycling PVC, you know, plastic for the intravenous fluid bags or Hudson masks for, or oxygen tubing, you know, mm-hmm. that we now turn into agricultural pipe with the work of Baxter. So that's fantastic. Um, but, uh, you know, we certainly had to involve infection prevention with that. But that was actually pretty straightforward because they said, well, all you're doing is diverting something from uh, landfill that is now going to go to be cycles. It's not it's not something that is actually infectious that mm-hmm. is now going to become uh, recycling. You shouldn't be doing that. So I, I digress a little bit because mm-hmm. I think this is an interesting story that we're having about and, and moving around. But to return to this uh, tray, we, had, we didn't have these initially, or at least we had them um, sort of a bit further away. And it was quite interesting. So some of my anaesthetic colleagues, I quickly discovered, you know, keen cyclists, um, runners, all the rest of it. Um, but when you came to, you know, to the to the anaesthetic trolley mm. and, um, you know, you just opened the trolley and there were just disposable trays in there instead of these reusable ones. I said, oh, okay, well, why don't we do a life cycle of that? So why don't we, I work with Scott McAllister, who was at that stage from RIT in Melbourne. And um, we found that the environmental difference wasn't that great in Victoria because, once again, based on brown coal, to, to wash this requires electricity, which is relatively high carbon. That's changing quickly, and this is, is starting to fall now in terms of its carbon footprint. It's certainly lower than the plastic tray. It already is. But it also saved money, and that was what I was really interested in. What I wanted to make sure of what we did is we did a time and motion study. In other words, mm. just how, how much time does it take case and therefore how much money behind the scenes in the central sterile supply department does it save? Now, it didn't save very much, but it was saving around 20000 30000 bucks a year by having reusable uh, trays rather than disposable. It was more just the fact that it was saving money that was the really important story here. Yes. So it was in addition to your um, apoplexy when you discovered uh, that, you know, that this was being this thing was being used, but also it actually saved money. That almost caused apoplexy on the part of some of um, my colleagues, where they just couldn't believe that was the case. Um, so, so that's really important. So, the science is the first step, but as you say, you're still shocked by the fact that we're using this because no one else is using it. Yeah. And so, that's the that's the next stage of how we translate that sort of story. And just just in case we didn't mention to the audience, it's it's a it's a green tray that's a reusable tray. It's um, I, I imagine yeah. it's processed through the sterilizing. Department? Yeah, so so it just goes through. Yeah, it, it actually just goes through the high temperature disinfection at ninety degrees. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it, as you say, I mean, the most important thing is that you know you're capping your syringes. You know, mm-hmm. it's, it's that micro um, sterile fields. Yeah. Sterile fields that are really important about drugs. You know, particularly propofol, for example. And because you know, as you soon as soon as you open these sorts of things, um, then there's um, uh, you, you lose that sterility um, and. Uh, it's um sorry about getting caught. Yeah. Um, the uh, you lose the sterility and um, then you need to rely on your micro. Yeah, um, and, and it's good that you know with ANTT, you know, and mm. it's yeah. they, they, yeah. it's, it's a big thing. Micro sites and uh, the micro sorry the um key yes. sites and key parts of micro sterile yes. environments a really big yeah. thing. But yeah, so traditionally sterile blue trays opened in a sterile package, but these are reusable. Um, mm. Yeah, which, which mm. is good. The other little point is that don't mm. waste cotton. So you, if you're going to use a disposable still, try not to have the cotton in it if you don't need to. Because most of the time, I mean, when I came to Western Health, there was stacks of cotton up there because the anaesthetists were too, they said, oh, well, we're throwing it away. Well, by definition, you're sort of are still throwing it away anyway because mm. it's sort of up there and it, then someone come, the cleaner comes along and you know, chucks them all away at the end of the day. Um, so it's, it's just thinking about what is your functional unit, as we'd say. The functional unit isn't just the tray. If you've got a tray that's plastic, it's got you know cotton and paper in there. The functional unit is the whole lot. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Mm. So we've gone through a few of these things. Any any other good examples from the anesthesia space? Maybe well, the other one I, I'm, I'm particularly you know excited about is these are reusable um, circuits, breathing circuits, um, and you know there's obviously a fairly similar disposable one. You're asking why have I got a disposable one at Western Hill? Yeah, um, that's another that, story. I've got yeah. to say, so some yeah. of our in our hospital chain, sometimes we have the reusable, sometimes we have the disposable. Yeah. 
and and look, let, we can. There's so many different stories we can get on here. It's it's all very interesting. So mm. the reason why that's happening is is another sort of a, a failure of the system in a way, isn't it? That globalization has meant that we can produce things very cheaply in countries that have low labor costs. Mm -hmm. And so then the manufacturers say, oh, beauty, we can just flog these at high volume and make a certain amount of profit on each one. Mm -hmm. um, where And the companies that you know are making the reusable ones, they don't actually make many. So their profit margins, I suspect, are not of the same order of magnitude. Mm -hmm. So that's why you're probably seeing the um, that the stock of the reusables is a bit variable from time to time. What you really need, actually, I mean, what I'd love to, to be involved with would be a you know, a company actually, just a reusable, sustainable healthcare company. Um, you know, but, but that, that all takes time and effort and requires mm -hmm. uh, a lot of work behind the scenes as well as a lot of injection of cash. But That's yeah, so it, you're right. There's 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 potentially problems in the hero that um, you may run out of reusable products. Not so much a problem with something like this because it's very mm -hmm. robust. It will last many long times. Um, these do get damaged and eventually get worn out. What I would say is our study was... Um, a comparison between disposable and reusable um, circuits, but more importantly, we looked at the length of use of circuits. Mm -hmm. What we were interested by was that in the US, until very recently, the decree from the Food and Drug Administration was that every circuit had to be changed with every single patient, um, even I if you had a filter. And now in Australia, that wasn't the case. We we're using them, you know, individual filters for every patient uh, for viruses and bacteria, etc., um, and changing it once a day. And I said, well, why don't we change it once a week? There's a little bit of data out there from Sweden and Germany that you could go to three days. And we said, why don't we do one day, three days, and seven days and check the microbiological load? So with the team from Monash Uni, actually, uh, micro, um, and involved with infectious diseases here, Western Health, we looked at um, what was the microbiological load uh, in terms of bugs, comparing the different methods, the different durations of uh, leaving the circuit in place mm -hmm. with, you know, obviously filter changes between each and every patient. Mm -hmm. um, and there were no differences. This didn't really surprise us too much because pre mm -hmm. started up to three days. And, anything. and interestingly enough, another German uh, team uh, went on and did a similar study, but they also studied the viruses. So they went further than us and found no difference. So it's interesting you see that variation in use um, mm -hmm. uh, between different countries. So it's not necessarily based on I, I suppose hard science. It, it, yeah, there it's are variations. It's, it's, yeah, I think that's probably what a lot of it is. Yeah. Yeah. yeah okay. So for me, it's quite exciting. I tell you, you know, why am I getting excited about you know reusable circuits? Well, because around Australia, even even if you're using disposable circuits, mm -hmm. you're only changing them once a week. So to me, the story of either using this and washing it every day is still going to be a higher footprint. We know that. Then changing this disposable one only once a week. Yes. That, yeah. So that, that's it. So the duration, it's not, it's not a story just to um, avoid and reuse. It's also about reduce in a sense. Yeah. And, 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 yeah. That, yeah. That makes sense. And definitely a theme here is, you know, avoiding and re reusing. It seems like that's, I mean, maybe this is a good time to ask the question. When you're faced with two options or three options, whatever it is, A option or B option, it, it mm. does get complex, right? You know, we're, you know, from everything from how do you get that product and how far does it have to travel to mm. what kind of energy mm. you might be using to wash that thing, you know, whether we're using dirty coal in or, you know, brown coal in yeah. Yeah. It versus hydro in Tasmania. And, and, and so when you're, say, maybe my question is, if you're a really caring healthcare practitioner who wants to do the best for their patients and you have two choices, it, it, I, would, I would almost say, is it safe to make an assumption of something or you'd have to do a life cycle assessment uh, before mm -hmm. you may make a, you know, the, the best choice? Yeah, it's yeah, so a good, good question. So what we try to do in our studies is, with Scott McAllister and carbon footprinting um, is we try to model other places. So it's not perfect, but you model it on the infrastructure and the electricity supply, for example. So mm -hmm. you've imagined if you're in, and this would vary between um different um uh, different countries um mm -hmm. but even different states so but but the the actual central sterile supply department washing of you know circuits and things like this is the same yeah whether you're in australia or new zealand or the united states or most of europe and probably i suspect in china and malaysia etc i i suspect it's a fairly similar approach at least for middle income countries and high income countries mm -hmm. um so those, um, those, th that's important to remember. So you can actually, you know, make assumptions that are probably close to the truth. 
Uh, you can also uh, so give example. You, what are those assumptions that people should make again? If mm. you try to decide between one thing or so another. So in other words, the actual washing, the amount of energy, so in terms of the kilowatt hours to mm. wash this or the water use in litres mm -hmm. would be similar in a washer in Victoria um, to Boston, to Delhi, um, or, or Beijing, for example, mm -hmm. assuming similar types of, uh, you know, washers. And a lot of these are multinational companies that actually flog these products. You know, they, even the, the, you know, the, the, for example, um, you know, the steam sterilizers or the washing um, equipment that are used are often multinationals. And so they'll be the same machines with the same power ratings and the same water use and all the rest of it, uh, regardless of where you are. So that that's pretty much, you know, okay to make assumptions pretty easily. Yeah, so what you, you then need to, you go on. And that's making the assumption of washing is generally going to be better than, uh, and reusing is generally going to be better than a disposable item. Yeah, that's, that's, that's generally the case we're finding again and again. Yes. Um, so good work that's come out from uh, Jody, Professor Jody Sherman from Yale, the United States, with uh, Matthew Eckelman and others, uh, Cassie Thiel from, uh, originally from Wisconsin as well, um, work that's coming out of the UK and France and Germany and other places. You, you're tending to find a recurring theme uh, and where you are of reusable being better, uh, carbon, water, whatever you want it to be, um, than disposable. Now, of course, people say, oh, hang on, but the water's being used here in Australia for us. Yes, that's true. Um, it's interesting to the making the manufacture of plastics actually does take a bit of quite a bit of water. Um, but that's happened. They say, oh, well, that doesn't matter. It's happening somewhere else. Uh, I don't care about that some other place. And yeah, that's true. I mean, so so you just have to weigh all these complexities up and think about what is important to you when when you do this. Yeah, let's. I mean, let's say uh, someone has will have trouble weighing it up, but we're going for mm. the best bang for buck yeah. for the yeah. for global for yeah. the health, of, health of Earth. That mm. would generally always go to reusable wash things versus uh, yes, yes, it would. So, so what you could say is what what's interesting here is um, that as we move to wall, so a, a, a good little throwaway line that. You know, if you're asleep out there, just wake up again. And the only thing you have to remember is renewables make reusables better. So mm -hmm. renewable electricity makes reusable equipment better, um, much better. Uh, and so if you're in New Zealand, what I would say is New Zealand should be, it should be reusable New Zealand. Yeah. It's just a lay down museum, reusable New Zealand. And yet it's far away from that. Talk to my New Zealand colleagues and it's all just disposable stuff they use. Yeah. I had friends from... Uh, some anesthetists who came from Hobart recently, and a bit like you, they sort of fell over. They said, "I, I, I can't believe this stuff. What's going on here?" Mm -hmm. And and that that saddened me in some ways, but also made me excited that there was real opportunity here mm -hmm. um, to to make a change, and they can go and do that. Mm -hmm. um, and and so they came and said, "You know, you've got all this all this stuff here. We we don't use any of that in Hobart or Launceston or Burnie or anywhere anywhere." Um, and I said, "But you are the place where it has to happen." because your energy source is just so much better. First of all, you've got lots of water, relatively, um, and your electricity is just, it's in, you know, it's dams, and so it's hydroelectric, very different to, to what's in Victoria, for example. Mm. So what I would say is, the is our studies have showed that even as the worst case, like Victoria, which is brown coal, um, reusables are about the same as disposables, but that's the worst case scenario. So everywhere else on the planet, basically reusables are going to win. Yeah, excellent. That's good to know. Um, so we've covered we've covered quite a few steps there of things to think about and things that people can action. Is there is there another level just mm. junior mm. doctors or just you know general yeah. doctors? Yeah, no, definitely. Yeah, yeah. I was just talking. Um, yeah, got a, a talk. So uh, just quickly talk. We talked a bit, a bit more about the micro, I suppose. Yeah. At the, moment. Uh, the meso. The, we, we sort of covered micro. I mean, as much as as we can, which is mainly about you as the anesthetist choosing, you know, not to use fifty syringes. I extrapolate, I'm exaggerating, but um, and, and to use a certain, you know, avoid death flame, nitrous oxide, use less oxygen, et cetera, et cetera. But um, also with that is um, uh, the uh, using less equipment where possible, using reusable equipment where possible. Now, the reusable is a problem because you can't do that alone. You need to be working with the head of anesthesia or the head of central sterile supply department. You know, it's not as if you can just walk in and say, I want these. Um, that requires lots of chocolate cake. Uh, and, um, you know, it just requires a real deep understanding and, and, and working with people to, to make change. And, and so it requires real input. 
And, and it also requires a team to do it. So that's all about the meso approach at the level of the department of what's going on. Mm. Uh, then, then, uh, then the macro level is how do you start to influence other hospitals, but more importantly, you know, um, rules and regulations that happen in healthcare. And I'll give you a really good example that's literally only just happened yesterday. So yeah. um, David Bramley uh, is the Deputy Director of Anesthesia at Western Health. Um, Mel Shackle is a, a great uh, project officer who's working with the new Footscray Hospital. I mention them because they're doing good work. But also we, we wrote to the Australian Health Infrastructure Guidelines, the people who actually make the rules on how you build a hospital. And we've now got it into, this, into those guidelines that it used to be the default that when you um, plumb uh, an operating theatre, you, you have air and oxygen and nitrous oxide. Mm-hmm. It is no longer the case. There's a little warning, a little red sign that says you don't actually have to have nitrous here. You can consider it. There's less to have been used. It doesn't have to be standard. Consider it strongly, of course, if you've got maternity and paediatrics nearby. Mm. Um, but in the operating theatre, consider whether you actually need it or not. And that is actually, it sounds really boring, but I get really Impressive. excited about that because, because that's about um, actual environmental data mm. is influencing now guidelines of how you build a hospital. Mm. I mean, to me, I get really excited about it. it uh, if you really wanted nitrous, you could have a cylinder and that would have nowhere near the amount of leak that you potentially have. And, mm-hmm. and we could talk about leak. And, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, as you know, one of our, I mean, there's so many fun things we talk about and also mm. sort of outrageous in a way. Like we found that the leak of nitrous here at Woodscrow Hospital a couple of years ago was more, more than three quarters of the total amount that actually was being bought, which mm. was just, you know, well, yeah. just wasteful. Yeah. And that's happening in many other places. I just want to pick up on the point that, you know, you really need at that meso level, you need to have a bit of a group and you know, mm. have a, mm. you know, a group mentality where you can get people on board with the ideas and get people along. You know, if there's, you know, there's going to be lots of people uh, listening to this from many hospitals around Australia. It, it's something yeah. you can absolutely do is to form little groups, you know, whether you're junior doctors, registrars or consultants, form a group if, you, if your hospital doesn't already have a group and absolutely liaise with mm. You know, whoever yeah. you need to, uh, there'll there'll be leaders in your space. But if you want more information, a- ABCs of anesthesia gmail dot com. Uh, you can see it in the story notes. Uh, please, you know, if you want some assistance with this, uh, please uh, write write into us because we can again give you some in, in intro steps, some evidence, whatever you need to. If you really care about this, that's a project that you can easily easily start and make some small changes and pick off that low level fruit to make some make some good uh, progress. Yeah, and, and what I would say is, so Doctors in the Environment Australia is really important. ANSCA has got a, um, a very important environmental um, working party, um, sorry, um, sorry, environmental sustainability network, um, and that, that's uh, that's really exciting as well. Right. Other colleges are getting on board. Uh, so there's multiple levels uh, at which you can influence things as a junior doctor registrar Mm-hmm. Even if you're moving peripatetic, peripatetically between different hospitals, mm. um, you, you won't be able to just suddenly get a hospital to start using these. But um, you will be able to influence otherwise tangentially, for example. And I think the students are really important as well. I, I, I'll say a good example of that is um, my own biased sort of interest in that I exist at the University of Melbourne as the Dean for Sustainable Healthcare because mm. the students said, hang on, you've got all... It's great you've got, um, uh, you know, the Associate Dean for Innovation and the Associate Dean for uh, Gender Inclusion and Diversity and also for Indigenous Health. That's great. Mm-hmm. But what about sustainable health care? Where, where's that? And the Dean said, oh, okay. So, you know, yeah. fantastic support from the students <laughs> and from the Dean and the Executive everyone to just get on and, and do exciting things. So that's really exciting. Uh, it's great mm-hmm. that um, they've been very supportive. We, we can absolutely link with link anyone with these existing organizations which have a will have a lot of information and ability to affect change wherever you are so that's that's great um yeah one or two one closing point no we got we yeah so we got about oh, 10 15 minutes so yeah oh, okay we'll keep going keep going but i just want to miss the point is that there, there are no silver bullets really i mean you could almost say maybe the bronze bullet is death rain and nitrous you can that that's great but you haven't knocked the vampires off yet um so, so the the everything else is just a gray, gradated change, and you're never going to reach, you know, a situation where healthcare doesn't have a footprint. Of course, it's going to have a footprint. We're using stuff. We will continue to use stuff. Um, you continue to use electricity. 
um, but you can move away from gas. I mean, another example is at the new Melton Hospital that's going to be built uh, to be the first all-electric hospital in Victoria, the third in the country, uh, behind the, the new Women's and Children's in Adelaide and also the Canberra Extension, uh, which was the first one, uh, at Canberra Hospital. Um, so that's really exciting. Why? Well, getting off gas is really important, but at the same time, moving, transitioning towards 100% renewable electricity, which is what our healthcare, for those who are not so aware, is um, uh, we're going to have a the health, public healthcare system in Victoria by the end of 2025, so not very far away, will actually be you know, essentially 100% renewable backed up by big batteries. Yeah, wow. That's a, that's pretty impressive. So the, the plan mm. for Melton is to be fully electric. And, and yes. so that is the first yes. hospital in Australia? To- in Victoria. No, it'll be the third in Australia. So the, the, the new women's and children in Adelaide, that, the, the um, South Australians win. Um, mm. But ahead of that was a um, Canberra, um, where their large hospital, new Can- Canberra hospital being extended, um, uh, is actually uh, underway. And that, that will be the first one. So none of them have been built yet, but uh, they're underway. Forbes, and we've talked about a number of different levels of this. Do you have a, a mm. particular aspiration for even just our, our hospital, or maybe you can say this for hospitals in general? Is there some aspirational goal that you have, or a, you know, a, a dream situation mm. that you have? Yeah, and and look, uh, I'll probably admit some of this is the bleeding heart of me, but I do think yeah. that we should never forget the important role that general practitioners play in maintaining a sustainable healthcare system. I don't just mean environmentally. I mean uh, for the patients, uh, for um, for us as, you know, tertiary providers or secondary providers, um, but also financially. Um, you only have to look at some other countries, and a good example with the US and some of my colleagues who say that, you know, there's a place where it has very little gen- community practice and relatively to the all the specialised practice, and that's a real shame. Um, I think it's really important from the sustainability of the system to have a better remunerated general practice. And I, I, I say this firstly, here because I just think it's really important mm. um, that primary care actually is, is vital and we've been seriously underfunding that mm. um, at the federal level for a decade. Mm. And GPs have had their income frozen, um, uh, you know, which I just think is ludicrous. Yeah. So I think that's really important because they, because, because, you know, stopping someone from smoking, stopping obesity, you know, reducing the, the prevalence of diabetes, vaccinating people, you know, these are all vital things mm. that reduce the pressures on what you and I do every day at work in a hospital. Yes. Um, yeah. It, yeah. I, I remember one of our talks doing the final exam course was, you know, we used to do so many, so much thoracic case. And you imagine all these patients. Mm-hmm. Lung cancer. Yeah. yeah, lung cancer, massive operations. And after the massive smoking cessation movement of mm. the last mm. probably 30 years, there's just mm. less of those cases. And I, 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 yes. I, can't even manage, I can't even imagine what the world looked like going into <laughs> theaters every day where, you know, just smoke a cancer, smoke a cancer. Um, and so, yeah, I think, I think we, really, we, re, we really feel the benefit of that. Uh, mm. And, and that's true. And, then, and it's really interesting you say that because in a way, Lahiru, and this is why I'm stressing this about you know, prevention, but it's also um, at a very high level that health in everything in other words, um, it's not just about the health minister or health it's per se. It's also these indirect things. You've just described a situation where a tax was put on cigarettes, which led to quite dramatic changes down the track. Mm. Not immediately, but in the ne- over the next decade or so. The same could be, you know, like well, you know, mm. even though there's, there'll be outcry, having a, a much greater alcohol tax mm. or sugar tax, mm. fat tax. I know this sounds terrible. Oh, you're nanny Forbes, you know, and that's being misogynistic, isn't it? But yeah, maybe you call me the poppy. But, um, you know, it's, 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 it's saying that there are things, health and everything, they're actually very high-level things mm-hmm. that influence how the rest of the healthcare system, socioeconomic status, all those mm. sorts of things, Indigenous health, they're all influenced by these very high-level things that are difficult, that they're, they're, they're they're, they're tricky problems, just like yeah. climate change is. They're and, a wicked problem. And my, um, you know, my minimal experience of this is, you know, maybe watching a Netflix documentary on on water and the scarcity of water, and mm. just think that, you know, things aren't actually priced the way they need to be priced. Like, yes. Like, you know, if, if smoking is going to cause this problem, if you tax it, then mm. it allows you to, you know, it lets you address that problem with the money and mm. earn. And I think that probably applies to many parts of this. But, yeah, yeah, for those for those naysayers, I would say is the tax 
isn't actually, yes, it's designed to ra- raise money, but in essence, it's taxing itself out of existence. Mm. Um, that's, you know, so it's different to other taxes where they, you know, government just wants to get as much as it can. Mm. Here, the aim is for no one to smoke and see if all that tax becomes useless. Mm-hmm. And it'd be the same for obesity and, you know, it wouldn't be wonderful if we're able to reduce obesity rates. I mean, it's terrible what's happening to our kids. Mm-hmm. That the, races, the rates of morbid obesity in Australia are greater mm-hmm. than what they've ever been. Yeah. Um, and that's a tragedy. Yeah. Uh, uh, that's a real tra- Anyway, I'm, I'm dwelling on those sort of things. They're, they're hard to change, but they're, they're things that the Australian Medical Association can, can advocate for, the College of Anesthetists, you know, in terms of obesity and Indigenous health or whatever it is. I think all those things are really important. So I haven't even got to environment yet. But um, uh, what I would say is those levels are really important, as well as then moving to so sort of the macro and then the meso level working. What I would love to see, uh, as you said, what, what I want to see is mm. I'd love to see a situation where all of us are just mm. translating the evidence. And there's ongoing research. We haven't sorted it all out yet. We've got works to do. It's going to be really interesting. What is going to be the role? I don't know. It, it, Think of any number of things. And he sort of always talk about you know, propofol and ending up in waterways and things like that. It's, it's, that's, that's great. There's mm-hmm. debate going on. There's, mm-hmm. there's interest in the topic. Um, there'll be other people researching this. It'll go on. So I think it's more that sort of vibe. Yeah. And I think that's exciting. It's changing. Yeah, I guess what you're saying, it doesn't, it doesn't matter if you might be at a micro level wrong about using something or another thing. But if you're thinking about it and you're trying to find the answers and there's research mm-hmm. happening, discussion happening, it's just a slow movement at the edge of knowledge. You know, mm-hmm. what was obvious in the past is now, you know, so what was contentious in the past is now obvious. And then you forget mm-hmm. that that's what you've learned. And then you're moving on to a new yeah. edge, edge of knowledge yeah. and then con- continuously refining it. I, you know, I'm really glad that we talked about all the primary prevention stuff because you know, I, I really thought this was going to be a discussion about just an- anesthesia and only focusing on that. But then to realize that actually that's, the, the bigger the bigger picture really is a whole bunch of other stuff of prevention and you know like we mentioned at the start yeah. reducing and re, uh, not using avoidance as well. So I don't want to take it away from all of those things that the mm. listeners are going to be able to do and change on a daily basis, mm. um, but but it is to be thinking more broadly as well. And your role as an advocate and as a scholar, um, yes. uh, which is part of being a, a doctor um, or a nurse or a physio or whatever else. Um, mm. So, so I think um, uh, there are some concrete things I hope I've given you to take away with, absolutely. Um, but also some bigger picture things as well. And it will vary a little bit depending on who you are. So, as I said, if you're a medical student or a junior doctor, you may not be able to influence things too much. But wouldn't it be great? I mean, a, a good example was, um, you know, at your university, do you have a sustainable healthcare club? You know, mm. you just form one and you find someone who, you know, someone like myself who would be supportive. They won't have much time. I don't have much time, but they'll still be able to just say, oh, look, you know, this is really interesting. Let's involve the teaching and learning dean, um, you know, that we we start to just meet, you know, there'll be some little lunch clubs once every few months, mm. talk about this sort of stuff we're talking about now. You know, what would you like to do? What are you good at? You know, mm. if you're good at IT, uh, great. Come along to me because I'm getting, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of half, half average. Um <laughs> Yeah, so I think there's there's all or you're good at designing things, or you know, there's all sorts of different things that I think yeah. you could have a role in. Yeah, that's great. As in, uh, often you know, I think the common thing I get asked is, do you have any projects? Do you have any any audits? Any anything that they you know junior doctors can do? Obviously, they're interested, but they also have to be doing something to move on mm. their careers. Mm. So mm. I, I think that's great. If you, if you're in the sustainability space, think about how you can whether you can start a group or be part of the group that's already existing. Tackle a lot of low level fruit. Uh, have associations yeah. with the hospital, with the with ANSCA, with um, university, uh, and 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 if you have skills outside of that, for example, if you're great with, you know, using Canva, you can you can start promoting certain things. If you're great with IT, mm. set up some kind of system or audit, uh, very mm. you know, reasonably easily. And again, we are very happy to direct you in the right spot spaces and try to support whatever you want to do, especially in this space. Mm. Um, I think we're slowly getting to about the time. I know you're incredibly busy and you've got probably a massive day ahead of stuff. Just to recap, anesthetics, avoid DES, avoid nitrous, uh, try to minimize oxygen where it can be uh, you know, minimized and think about reusing, but even just avoidance of things. And I really like that we talked about you know, on, on the grander scale of things, involving people and having that discussions and moving forward, as well as the importance of primary prevention, primary care. 
uh, and uh, you know all the important things that avo- avoidance and public health oh, sorry public health measures and avoidance of um, you know things like smoking and uh, you know, things that will just generally make people healthier overall. I think that's pretty much a, a, a decent summary of it all. Yeah, and so I would say um, mm-hmm. if you can, if you're a student, join the um, or or a doctor, do, join the Doctors for the Environment Australia DEA. Uh, with Ananska, there's the Environmental Sustainability Network, which um, Scott Maher led and now Archie uh, is, is leading. So there's some really good opportunities there. Um, at, many, at many levels, in different levels, uh, Australian Medical Association, the Student Australian Medical Association, AMSA. Mm-hmm. Excellent. Thanks for your time, everyone. Thanks, Forbes. Can't thank you enough for being on, and uh, we'll, I'm sure we'll have more t- chats about how to move forward with uh, in this space again. So thanks very much. Please, um, thanks very much for having you on, and thanks, everyone, for listening and watching. If you have any questions, please uh, email at me at abcsofanesthesia at gmail.com. Um, and definitely, you've got the. I'll, I'll put all the links in the story notes to those organisations. Uh, but if you want to help out, please let me know. Thanks, and uh, see you next time. Now, what's new with ABCs of Anesthesia is that we're forming a whole bunch of very comprehensive courses for every stage of your anesthetic journey, from medical student to procedural skills, from foundations in anesthesia, as well as really important exam lectures and clinical anesthesia courses as well.